Thanks, Paul. Hi, welcome to this episode of the UCM Short Film Showcase. I'm Dr. Mark von Schlemmer, and today I have with me Jessica Summerkamp, the producer director of the short documentary film B Roll, spelled B E E, like the insect. So, <laughs> Jessica, you produced this film um, in the uh, fall of 2017 for the documentary class. Yes. What drew you to this subject? Um, it was actually the star of my documentary, Kathy Misko. I met her doing a still photography project and she just had this wealth of information about bees and I thought, this is perfect. Wow, wow. So what, what did you learn in the process of making this? Uh, well, like I said, she, she knows a whole bunch about bees and my <laughs> documentary just scratches the surface. You know, I kind of went in thinking, oh yeah, bees are dying. But there's problems, you know, with the environment. And she just had the answers to everything, you know, the what's going on, the solutions, um, what's actually happening with the bee revolution. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, well, now let's watch the film. So let the film roll. I really don't know why I did it. I don't have a clue. I lived in South Kansas City and I was 16, just had my driver's license, but I drove to Raytown High School for six, seven, eight weeks for beekeeping classes. And um, I didn't get bees until, well, until 19... 89. I got started in bees because the bees chose me. I had a baby on my back and I was planting our vegetable garden and the sky grew dark and I was really afraid. I, I grabbed all my children and we all ran into the house and looked out the upper story window to see what it was and I really thought it was like the time of Moses. And But what it was, a swarm had come and then we watched it. Uh, it lit in a tree in the backyard and I then called the 4-H extension and they got me in contact with the beekeeper that told me where I could drive is 12 miles down this road, two miles there, I'll see a big white barn. He said, go in that barn and told me exactly what equipment to get and he, he had all his bee equipment stored up. So. Uh, drove the van up under the tree, put all the equipment on top of the van, and my children had just found an old football helmet in a junkyard in the woods. I put that on my head with my husband's jacket and overalls and boots, and then I took a netting that belonged on the top of my baby playpen, and I put that over my head, and I climbed up on the van. I cut down that limb, laid it onto the hive, and the bees just all marched in. And But there was a little part um, that, that some of the bees flew back up into the tree, so I then thought, oh, I need to get that limb, and so I climbed back up on top of the van with the hive sitting right there and I took the limb down and carefully laid it on the hive and when I did that I leaned over the hive and that that net from the baby playpen I didn't think to tuck it into the overalls well it then scooped around the hive and it became a butterfly net so all those bees came up on in and got caught in my hair and yeah, I did get stung. <laughs> but that was 29 years ago, so I, you know, I've been hooked ever since. You'll know when a bee's angry or upset or agitated. They don't just go, mm, check you out. They're like, ee! That means somebody's agitated. I have to think about that, how many women beekeep? And initially when I got started, it hardly any, you know, I was the bee lady. And uh, now there's actually a lot of women beekeeping. And uh, there's Women in Beekeeping Facebook page, it's not very old, let's just say a couple years. And it is now up to 14,000, over 14,000 members from all over the world. 
and uh, sometimes we have to translate, you know, put a C translation, you know, to see what they're talking about. And then there's some beekeepers on women in beekeeping that use the skeps, the old fashioned, you know, what they show in Winnie the Pooh, the beehive skep. And that's actually how the first bees were brought over to the United States, was in skeps. We did not have European honeybees here. They were actually brought over in like 1621, 1622. But before that, North America did have a honeybee. And in Arizona, there's a fossil of it, and it is a, a honeybee, but they're extinct now. So it's not that we never had honeybees used to be you can take bees, put them in your backyard, forget about them, let bees do what bees do, and it's not that way now. They really have it hard. There's a number of things that have changed. Our agriculture has changed to where there's not as much forage for not just the bees, but all pollinators. We're seeing more monocrops, just one crop, and in very, in very large sections of land. And we're using um, more chemicals to control that. Uh, what's also changed with the bees is we have had a mite that has come into the United States. It gets on the bees, it sucks their hemolith, it, uh, and when it does that, it injects viruses into the bee, and that weakens the bee's immune system. And then we're using more chemicals, so the bees are already weak. Bees really have it tough now, so as beekeepers, we need to be able to recognize when they're in trouble and then possibly what to do when they're in trouble. One mite in April can actually grow to over 3,000, almost 4,000 mites in August. I'm doing something different here since 2008. I've been working on genetics. I test for mites. If they have a low natural mite count, then I'll propagate, I'll pass on genetics from that colony for another one. I try and keep the we, survivor genes, basically. It was actually a, a research student up in Nebraska had figured out that if uh, you put any inert dust on bees, it will cause the bees to groom themselves and also if you can kind of heat up the bees, the mites tend to release. And it just so happens powdered sugar ends up being a food to the bees too. But I'll take a frame of bees, I'll look at it, make sure the queen isn't on there because I don't want to, you know, shake her up. And I put it up on end and I have a, a special um, uh, it's really a scoop, but it has a flat edge on it, and I run it down the bees' backs, and they just all fall in. It's just, I can do this without a veil, and I don't get stung. It, it, it doesn't make them angry. It probably just confuses them, but I just run down their back. They all fall in, and I have on my scoop mark three ounces, which would be 300 bees. Well, I take that, and I dump it into a quart jar that has a sprout lid on it, and then the bees try to get out, and so I will bounce them down. They all fall down, and then I put about two tablespoons of powdered sugar in there, and put the lid back on, and then I roll them, set them aside for a couple of minutes, and they heat up uh, in the shade, or they'll heat up in the sun and cook. So in the shade, and they get warm, they group themselves, and then I take them after they've sat there a couple minutes, and I just shake out the powdered sugar, with the lid on there, the bees stay in, the mites fall out, and then I'll count how many mites and then divide by 300 anyways I can get a, a percentage of how many mites on 100 bees. If I have a mite, high mite load, I also do heavy powdered sugar dusting on my bees. That's what I've been doing, so I'm not applying a miticide chemical. Oh, I love it. I love it. I, it's really a lot of fun to do. So 
here we're losing bees. Everybody wants to save the bees, and um, I call it the beekeeping revolution. Like three years in a row, we had between over 200 people to 150 people sign up for beginning beekeeping workshops three years in a row. So these are new beekeepers wanting to save the bees and they are going for education, but you can't learn everything in one day. Some beekeepers are buying colonies, uh, learning off of YouTube, getting their bees, and then they have their bees, and in a big panic, they don't know what to do. They don't know what they're seeing. It's not as easy as what they read. There's a lot of drama in the bee world now. Um, treat or not treat for the mites and their bugs, you know, their viruses. Treat or not treat. Um, learn or not learn. There are some beekeepers that well, I don't want to call them beekeepers, really, uh, bee havers, where they will purchase the bees, put them in a box, and then say, nature needs to take its course. I'm a hands-off. I won't split them. I won't feed them. I won't test them. I won't do anything. Let the survivor bees survive, and then we'll end up with this really strong breed and genetics of bees. And... That, to me, um, I think is ignorant. Maybe not purposely. I think I don't think it really works that way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really believe if you're going to keep bees and be a keeper of the bees, then you have a great responsibility of stewardship and should learn as much as you can learn. <laughs> I don't see it that way. I wouldn't let my bees starve. <laughs> You know, if, if they were hungry, because I feel like if I put them in the box, I have responsibility. Now, if they chose that box, that's different. It's like, oh, you're on your own. <laughs> you chose that box, you're on your own. One thing I will say, he invested in a stranger to help me, and in turn, help the bees, and that really made an impact on me and so that's what I do. I like to help other people and in turn that helps the bees too.